Mario Mann, he's a longtime friend of mine, and we love playing together. Us playing together is gonna be a reflection of the theme of this presentation, love your practice. So I'm gonna let you all in on a little secret that I've come across in how to have a longevity in your career as a musician, as a drummer, and uh, the secret is this. Make your playing feel so good that you become addicted to it. Like you feel bad when you don't practice. Like that's what I've found. I'm 46 years old, I've been in LA 20 years, and had lots of reasons to stop playing, but the one thing that kept me wanting to play is when I didn't, I felt bad. And so that sounds a little bit negative, but really the fact is that when it feels great to play and you want to do it, you're a fan. There's more joy in your life. So, so loving and practice, how do we want to go about improving our love, having more love for what we do? Well, that's what the next two hours for me are going to be about. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the ROI toolkit. First thing, the return on investment, you all familiar with ROI, the time that you're putting in, the money that you're putting in, to being here at this school. You want to make the most out of what you're investing, but investing your time, investing your money. And so there's some tools that we can talk about to make that happen. So my fantasy when I play the drums is to be able to put my spine in motion at the tempo that I want to play and have all my limbs comfortable playing any subdivision in any dynamic level that my brain wants it to. So the input, let's say this in this case from Ariel, is going to come in, I'm going to hear it, it's going to register as something I need to do to accompany that, and then that message I want it to come out through my body, through the sticks, into the instrument. And so that's, that's my fantasy. You can just like put this in motion, you don't have to worry about rushing or dragging. You know that anything you hear, everything's mapped out already. So that's kind of, that's what I'm after on the drum set. And if your practice can reflect that, you're more likely to be able to accomplish that. So uh, actually after this, I'm playing a Vitello's, I'm playing a Bar Mitzvah tomorrow, I'm playing a hotel gig from that, <laughs> that uh, tomorrow night. Point being, this is joy for me. Like well, I'm happy to be a working drummer in Los Angeles. I'm very happy to be sponsored to talk to you all here at the Musicians Institute. But uh, this moment with Ariel is gonna be about our love for playing. And joy is contagious. The more love you can have for doing this, the more you can convey that and express that to your audience. So like, I'm not one who's into being dark. I don't know, some musicians are into being negative and being a marker for their instrument. Oh, I practice eight hours a day, I'm so miserable, but I'm getting better. I don't believe that. I really believe in staying positive, and the more joy you feel here, the more your audience is gonna feel. So uh, that being said, Arya Man, someone I love to play with, is going to let this be an expression of conveying joy. That's the theme for this. And uh, oh, you know what? Actually, let's make this. A, I want to read off a little, little quick quote here. Alec Guinness. Anyone know who this actor is? Uh, he was Obi Wan Kenobi in Star Wars, so you know whatever he says has to be true. <laughs> so he's Alec Guinness says, "I try to get inside a character and project him." One of my own private rules of thumb is to not have is that I have not got a character unless I have mastered exactly how he walks. It's not sufficient to concentrate on his looks. Just read this part again. He wants to focus. He doesn't feel like he has the character, like he's really inside the character as an actor until he has his walk, which when I first heard that, I thought was kind of curious. Like, wow, you would think it would be like his speech or you know, really learning the lines or understanding context of the scene or about it up, but no, it's his walk, how he moves around his environment. And that meant a lot to me as a drummer hearing that. Because if you can like kind of put your walk in motion, you can rely on that. You know that you own the walk of what you're doing on the instrument. You can do whatever you want inside the context of that character as an actor or inside the rhythm as a drummer. So I'm gonna try to we're gonna go on a walk together, Ariel and I, and uh, hope you like it. We'll start up some free time and get into a groove. That's our rehearsal just now. So. <laughs>
the most poignant experiences I've had, and the ones that I've learned the most from, are those that I didn't get what I want. So just, just kind of shift that definition in your mind of what an experience is like. The most important experiences you're gonna have, ultimately, are gonna probably be failures. And it's like, really embrace that. So experience is when you don't get what you want. And now you can treat that as, oh my gosh, this didn't happen, this terrible thing, blah, blah, blah. You can really get down and negative about that. If you already have an inclination to be negative, you're more likely to do that. But so just look at those opportunities where you, when you don't get what you want as that's what your real experience is. So there's something that I got that I didn't want on uh, May 8th, 2010 at 4.40 p.m. And it's really made a huge impact on my life. And so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about that arc and it'll help to explain everything else because it's pretty much shaped my entire impression of music and life. <laughs> so this is my first kind of public opening of and discussion and talking about what that's meant to be, my experience. So a little bit about my story, I would like to say. I was a kid growing up in Minnesota. I have somebody to vouch for the validity of what I'm about to say. This is my brother. He's known me my whole life, so you know that I'm not, uh, if you can chime in if I'm getting any facts messed up. <laughs> So uh, we grew up together in Minnesota, and uh, yeah, I just, oops, got a screensaver. Oh, it's already went to password. Okay. Well, um, grew up in the cold of Minnesota, and I very quickly came to find that I was a, I, well, it's good that my brother's here, because I had a little bit of an inferiority complex, because my brother was so damn good at everything. And so the drums, for me, were something that I could say, hey, I can do this no matter what anybody says or thinks about me or even what I think about myself, I have this thing that I do that I've committed my time to and it's mine. And it was a big part of my identity being a drummer growing up. And this was where I would cut to a bunch of pictures of me being a dork in yeah. high school. But, <laughs> but uh, I'll see when Stuart comes back, I'll... Uh, yeah, that's me wanting to be cool. I wanted to be Dave Lombardo from Slayer. Oh, well, yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I, obviously, I was like having the picture taken. I wanted drums to be like the defining element of who I am. I like didn't even take a picture without drums and sticks. In my mind, it's like, that's what I am. This defines me. And, and that worked for me to the po I, <laughs> Dork dot JPEG. Dork. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's me. We'll leave the dork up there. <laughs> so and so you know, I'm mature. I don't look like that anymore. I don't think like that anymore. And so I I ended up getting a scholarship to North Texas, which was a huge deal for me. It's a big jazz school, and it really made me feel like, okay, well, all this time I input, uh, maybe it was good for me. I felt like, okay, competing on a global level with other students, I'm, you know, I'm of a certain ilk that deserves this. And it really helped me to feel like I was moving on the right path. And school is really such an awesome place to meet people who are like-minded and who are on the same path as you are. And we will talk more about that. And uh, so after that North Texas now, like Rich Redman was in school with me, Ari Honig, amazing jazz drummer, Keith Carlock was, man, the ultimate ego destroyer, that freaking guy. I remember seeing him at Karma Cafe when I first moved to Texas, and I was like, yeah, I wanna see who the badass cats are, yeah, check them out, you know, I was kind of good where I came from, and I remember seeing him when he was 19 years old, and the kid was just slaying. I mean, he was self-actualized as a musician at 19, and it was just so humbling. I got to know him a little bit and just learned, okay, you pretty much practice all day, play gigs all night, and if you're not doing that, you're moving your drums or listening to music. That was his life. <laughs> and that's what I learned, and that's what I followed. He was my role model for a long time. And so I left North Texas, actually didn't graduate in all transparency. There was this magic moment where uh, Dan Wojciechowski went on the road with Leanne Rimes and Keith Carlock moved to New York and suddenly there was just a ton of work in Dallas and I was <laughs> like, get me out of school, I'm gonna go make a ton of money and, and get that experience that I felt like I needed, all these positive experiences, recording jingles, playing in top 40 bands, doing blues, all styles of music in Dallas was awesome for that and I was able to put away a good chunk of money which allowed me to move to Los Angeles in 2000. So that's when I came out here 
and uh, started playing with a guy, Matthew Fisher. As in, there was a bass player, Dan Lutz, I went to school with, who's a great musician and very well respected, helped me out a lot. And uh, enjoyed Los Angeles and uh, eventually got to play in this band. I auditioned for this dude back there with Red Elvises. And I'll just show this little arc that I experienced. changed my attitude and I changed my look a little bit. I remember doing this photo shoot. <laughs> I know, man. I remember like thinking, I am a rock star. I want to have the imagery. I want to have all the trappings of like what a rock star is. I want to look like it. I want to act like it. I want to dress like it. I want to be that. And that should eventually like give me whatever I think I deserve out of life. So this was about 2008, and so I started working on 3D drumming, which was uh, my instructional series, and it was a three hour long uh, instructional video that I planned to release. I wound up with a Pearl endorsement, I remember like Drumhead Magazine was going to do an article about it, it was just all this continuing saga of Adam's rise to the top. It really seemed like that's where I was headed. So I left Red Elvises because I felt like it was it was beneath me now. You know, I'm a, I'm a rock star. I mean, look at this freaking guy. You know, he just he should be a modern drummer, right? So here's Adam thinking, all right, world's my oyster. I uh, and I so I left Red Elvises and I planned to just be available for whatever the next bigger opportunity was. So I was taking a lot of different freelance jobs, and there was a band, Cafe R and B that I started playing with, and a great band. And my third gig with them was a private party, and uh, I remember loading in around 4 p.m. And um, yeah, so the first couple trips of drums, I was bringing into this place we were playing, everything went great. But uh, on the third trip, somebody closed the glass door that I was supposed to walk through to set up my drums, and I had my gear, and I walked into this glass door, 440, May 8th, 2010. And uh, unfortunately, I'm really tall, so I like hit it here, and it, and it cracked. It, it shattered. 
And so shards of glass started falling down on this door. I was holding my gear, and a glass hit my hands. And it was it was gory. It was really bad. It was I was opened up. <laughs> there was blood everywhere. The bass player came over and pulled me to the sink and wrapped my arms in towels to just kind of decrease the blood and uh, called an ambulance. And this was all right before I was supposed to play. And it was, it was very surreal. I remember like kind of hitting the glass and it cracked. And I remember it looked like kind of reality cracked. Like it hadn't occurred to me that it was a glass door that I hit. And I remember just like not even knowing what was happening. I kind of like reached out to see what it was that I hit. And that was really my downfall. So I went to the doctor and uh, I, it turns out I was incredibly lucky and outside of not being lucky. <laughs> but the fortunate thing was that this tendon was not cut. It was cut in half. And if this tendon is cut, you will never play drums the same way again. It just won't heal correctly. And so there was also a lot of damage to this hand, but this was the main concern from the doctor. So they put both my hands in casts, and they told me not to play drums for a year. Whoops. I'm just going to put this up here because this became a very important thought in my life. <laughs> so I'm at the doctor and they're, okay, we're going to have to have your cat hands and casts for two months. Don't do anything. Don't do anything for two months, basically, that will require your hands. And then once that's done, don't play drums for a year. And this, this wasn't part of my plan. You know, I, had, I was doing everything right. You know, I was on this trajectory, and uh, it's like, wait a minute, this wasn't meant to happen. God, why did you do this to me? You know, what, where is my identity? Who am I if I don't play drums for a year? Who am I to my friends? Who am I to my family? Who am I to myself? And so, I, man, two months with your hands in casts is non google -able. You will not know what that's like until you do it. You can't put your pants on. You can't feed yourself. You, it's, it's bad. And I just, I remember thinking like, how do I find out more about this? How do I get through this? I got, you know, about three weeks into it. Whew. Man, it was tough. My tenor identity was kind of destroyed to me and I didn't even know if I would ever get back to a point where I would be a competitive musician in this town. And so I came across this in my searchings. There wasn't much online about what to do as a professional drummer in that situation. So this is Maslow's need theory. Can everyone see this? This made a lot of sense to me. So the idea is, like, first of all, there's phys physiological needs, like just basically what you need to survive. There's security, feeling like you're part of a group, being loved and blind, not just being. So the next step is actually having loving connection with the people who are in your community. And next above that is feeling, having esteem for something that you do, being respected for the time that you put into something. And if you climb to that level, then ultimately you, the ultimate expression of humanity is self-actualization. Have you turned this term before to be self-actualized? Yeah, I mean, that sounds great. But what I've found is that if you remove the bottom one, all the others go away. It's not like you keep like getting up there and you get to like this self-actualization and then it's like, oh, maybe you lose it a little bit, maybe you get it back. It's just, it's very fragile. It's incredibly fragile, and it was to me. And I really felt like I lost all of these things. Now, I mean, I can talk about this now, nine years later, because I did put in a lot of work to recover from that. But I just want to be able to, I want, this is my first time I'm actually talking about this publicly. Because, man, I did not want to talk to anybody about this. This was very deeply personal to me. And some of the thoughts that were going through my mind as this was happening, I really didn't want to share with people. Because uh, I had to learn a lot about the society I was raised in, I needed to learn a lot about what real identity is and a lot about what masculinity is. I felt kind of impotent. I felt like I am not a potent individual. All this training, I was trained by the best, and with that self, da 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 whatever, you know. I felt like I was competitive with all my heroes and suddenly I had this deficiency. I had this thing that just no longer allowed me into the cool kids club as a musician or whatever. And so I had to re-examine a lot. And so I, I want to talk about the emotional effects 
of this. And I also want to talk about the physical effects of this because I have residual nerve damage in my right hand. And it's for years, it's made me feel like I needed to make my image of myself different from who I really was. Because to my peers, I mean, they would ask me like, oh, you had this accident, you know, how are you? It's like, oh, everything's fine, you know, still hire me. I'm still capable, you know, I still need to be able to pay my bills. I still need to have this physiological needs of food and water, you know, being just being able to play drums for this. And, but at the same time, I knew that I was not competitive. I knew that I had to employ so many countermeasures just to keep from rushing. Because this nerve damage that exists, still exists in my hand, it's between these two fingers. So as long as I'm not holding the stick between these two fingers, I can be relaxed. But how do you not hold the stick there? <laughs> That's a pretty important fulcrum. And so I've, I've really struggled with, with this a lot. And so as far as like loving your practice, what I found out is that that's the most important thing you can do. Because when I wasn't able to love what I did anymore, I didn't know what to do. I was at a loss. I mean, what do I do? Am I, am I ever going to get back to a point that I'm happy with my playing? Am I ever going to you know, have an identity. Am I always gonna live, am I gonna live out my life, you know, I could have been a contender, you know. And I mean, here you are, you in music school, with some of you, and who knows what's gonna happen to you. And so I just wanna talk to you a little bit about how to prepare for the worst. I mean, it sounds negative, and I'm totally not a negative person, but being a, understanding worst case scenario helps you when it happens. Like, because if you don't prepare for it, and it does happen, I, had some pretty self-destructive -destruct thoughts about that situation I was in. So that's a little bit about my story. So it's a, when the old ways don't work anymore is the theme of this first hour. And so that's, I mean, I had all these tools that I was using that got me to a point where I felt like I, you know, I was, I could use these tools the rest of my life and be successful, but I found out I had to learn new tools. And there are so many new tools these days. And uh, to, just to be open to them and understand what they are, I think can help you a lot, especially in education, especially at Musicians Institute. You have so many great teachers here and peers and people to draw from. And this is really a great place to be. So I'm gonna talk about, so one day, <laughs> I was in my recording studio. I was building a studio. I figured, well, if I'm not gonna ever be a great drummer again, at least I can be involved in music. And so I developed, developed a studio, and there were some friends over recording, and I'd actually had a really good take. I played on a track, and it went really well, and for whatever reason, I missed those points in my hand that made me tense up. And my boss said to me, Adam, what the heck, why, how you played so well, how do you have all this freak outs about, you know, what's wrong with you, you sound great. I was like, well, the problem is, is that I don't like playing. I don't like it. I sit down and practice, and the best I can do is not suck. The best I can do is try not to get tense. And like, I, mean, I kind of felt like tension was an amateurish thing. I felt like, oh man, I see these drummers playing all tense, and it is, oh, they're beginners, you know, and I saw that in myself, and I felt like, wow, I'm kind of a beginner. I mean, like, I would consider myself that. If I were to go see myself play, I'd be like, oh man, he's got tension problems. And at the same time, I'm trying to put myself forward as being a competitive member of the LA music community. And it was, there was this distance, there was this gap between who I was pretending to be and who I felt I was. And that's a really dangerous thing. And I'll, I'll be talking more about that coming up. So, but uh, this session that I was in, there was an acupuncturist, Alec Bridges, who helped me out a lot. He was like, hey man, I." Let me help you. I'm studying at Kansai Gaidai Institute when I was in Venice at the time. And I started going to acupuncture and it made a huge difference. The very first day, I, like, I, swear, I swear I was stoned. I, like, after I had the acupuncture done, there was so much blood going, like opening up my nervous system and my heart rate. And I was like, wow, this is an incredible experience. And Alex was like, yeah, you took very well the acupuncture. It's working for you. And if you have any kind of nervous damage or like any tingling sensation, anything like more, that's more muscular, 
you might or have to do with a bone, you might go to a chiropractor, but anything with your nervous system, acupuncture can help you. And it's been a huge difference for me. And I've been taking acupuncture for about six years, and it's, I would definitely not be back in shape how I am now without it. And uh, Tony, I, I went on a blues cruise that I was playing, and uh, there, I met a drummer, Tony Bronigal, on the cruise, and he saw this issue I have in my right hand, had, have, and he came up to me and asked me about it, I kind of broke down, and I told him my story, and he's like, man, it must be horrible for you, let me, I, let me work with you. He had a shoulder injury that he had to work through, and so there are lots of musicians who've had injuries and worked through them, and with varying degrees of success, and I was one of them, and still am. And as a community of us, you know, we kind of bond together over this because it's really hard to try to be positive about it when on the inside you feel like you're really not competitive. I mean, if I'm on a session, like Vinnie Caliuta might get the call if I can't do it, right? I mean, we're all, we're in LA, some of the best musicians in town are surrounding us. If we have a job, the list of people who want whatever we're doing is huge. And very likely, if you have an injury or you have a physical shortcoming, somebody can do it better. And so being aware of that is gonna lead me to <laughs> my next little bit about, uh, so Tony helped me kind of get over the physiology of it. I would go to his place and I would play drums. He would have me sit down and he would just have me play. And there would be moments when I was playing. And I would do something. And my whole arm would tense up. I would be playing the House of Blues. And I would make some move around the drum set. And my whole arm would tense up. And I was supposed to keep playing. So what I would do is I would, I would pretend like I was playing the hi-hat. And do this. Because I couldn't actually play it. And then I would, it would take a few minutes for my hand to relax. So this was my coping man. Meanwhile, hey, yeah, I'm having a great time. I hope my arm doesn't fall out. And, I mean, and it was really exhausting. I mean, it just looked physically exhausting to play. And you get this kind of sound. You, you know, if your arm is tent rather than you get and so yeah, that was the sound I was dealing with. Meanwhile, the left hand was that. There was all kinds of asymmetry problems I was dealing with. And I ended up coming up with a bunch of exercises to deal with asymmetry, which is something that I was a little embarrassed about because it's something that I didn't want to talk about. But years later now, I recognize that asymmetry is a huge problem with young drummers and drummers studying the instrument. And uh, I'll get to that in a little bit as well. But so Tony would have me play, and he would notice some move I would make around the instrument. And he'd be like, oh, stop, 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 that was it. And so we would work on just that move. Just try to find ways. We, he had me kind of pull Gad's thing, like Gad's fulcrum is back here, because it would kind of get me out of this danger zone. But hitting a rim shot with the right hand, like, you know, it's like hit or miss. It's, you know, pretty sketchy. But, uh, and so Tony, working with him, I would do a lesson, and I would find, OK, here I found something that, uh, Spivak, do you have any study Spivak here, middle finger? That was what he was teaching me at the time. I, was, I studied Moeller with Ed Sof and Stone Stroke, and then there's French grip and German grip and outward rotary and inward rotary, and all these techniques I used to get around the drum set, but when you have nerve damage, they don't mean shit, because at any given moment, your arm might fall off. So uh, there, was a, there was a point I got to over years with Bruce, or I'm sorry, with Tony, that I was finding this. I was like, oh wow, there's a weird thing that's happening here where it feels comfortable. And he's like, well, that looks strange, but it looks a little bit like Gruber. You know, Freddie Gruber technique? Do they teach that here? Does anyone? Okay, it's, it's, it's similar to this. It, it kind of looks like Gruber technique. And Tony said, well, you know, that's not really something I teach, but uh, maybe you should look into studying Gruber. And so there's a guy, uh, Bruce Becker. He, yeah, he, he's he studied with Gruber for a long time. And Gruber passed away, and he's kind of carrying the torch. He's really one of the authorities on teaching, you know, Gruber's technique, you know, 
uh, minus the alcoholism. You know, we all, everyone loved Freddy Gruber, but he could be a little bit challenging to study with. And so I feel like Bruce is kind of the ideal version of that. You get all the meat of Gruber technique, and then he's just super articulate guy, which is great. And so, so I worked, so I found out, okay, wow, I'm, I think I'm finding something here that might actually work for me because this circumvents any kind of tension problems I was having here. And so, but this is pretty counterintuitive, like to play drums this way. So I, there's this technique that he had me work on where you would just lift the stick up into your hand. And the hard part is, is to have it not jiggle around. And, it, and I was like, I was like, oh my gosh, what the heck? This is going to take years to work on this. And uh, so I was like, well, how am I going to have the time to figure out Gruber technique? Well, since now that I kind of feel it's like a fluid stroke, I mean, there's no tension at all. It's almost like if the stick stopped at any point in this stroke, it would fall out of your hand. It's really the G force of the stroke that's even keeping the stick in your hand at all. And so I ended up looking, okay, I have this studio, I had a property management business, I was playing gigs around town, there was no time whatsoever to work on this. And so I was like, you know what, I have to stop it all. I have to stop everything I'm doing and just work on kind of getting my head straight and working on this new technique. And I didn't know how it was gonna work. And I remember reading Tim Ferriss's book. Anyone know Tim Ferriss? Uh, he's awesome. He's a, and he has this theory again about worst case scenario. He's like, if you're ever gonna enjoy and uh, try to participate in a new venture, uh, always figure out worst case scenario, which sounds kind of negative. But in the end, it really helps you to have any confidence whatsoever, I feel. So I was really, I mapped out my worst case scenario. What happens if I freaking go live with my parents or maybe move in with a friend in Denver? I don't know, I'd like just leave what I'm doing, get out because it's not helping me and really take some time to kind of have a sabbatical, kind of like just have. And so there was a friend of mine, Nikhil, who oddly enough had a friend who booked cruise ships. And I talked to him about what I did, and he was like, hey man, why don't you check in with my buddy at Landau Music? And they happened to need a drummer for a six month contract in the Caribbean, and it was, a, he worked two nights a week, 10 hours a week, and I was like, you're kidding me. This is like the perfect thing for me. And so I uh, took, packed up all of my gear, and I went and hung out with some friends for a couple months until the contract started. And I went out and did a six month trip. And so I really managed my time well <laughs> over that six months. There's, I like, this is where we're at the lobster number three. So let's talk a little bit about the lobster. The lobster is a, a skeleton on the exterior. So the problem is for that, it's, it protects it from other fish, but it, it, when it needs to grow, it can't. And so how does the lobster grow? Well, it cr crawls into the coral, it has to kind of protect itself from other predators, and it sheds its exoskeleton. At that point, it's extremely vulnerable. It's very, it, it needs to grow a new skeleton that can let it expand. And I kind of like this idea. I was like, wow, it kind of feels like me. I feel like I really need to change what I'm doing, and I need a whole new skin, because the one I was in was not working. What I had learned up to that point was not helping me. And so I read a lot of books and I worked on Gruber and fortunately there was a drummer, Giorgio Rojas, who was in one of the other uh, shows on the ship and he was a Peruvian percussionist and he was helping me all kinds of Afro-Peruvian stuff. We would hang out and play together. And I was really amazed at the shift that happened to me. And I just wanna share a couple books with you. So, how can I get through to you? <laughs> oh, <laughs> was that something? <laughs> My time's up. You need to turn that off, brother. Okay. Yeah, oh, there you go. There we go. <laughs> you got time even when you're not trying. That's <laughs> What's funny is it just. It's 2 p.m. right now, right when the alarm went off, so that's kind of odd. 
So there's what I was going through and what I didn't realize was a bit of a problem for me was there was a word that I was scared to call what happened to me. So this incident that happened May 8th, 2010, it, it's a trauma. And I mean, even like nine years later, I really struggle with calling it a trauma. I don't know why, there's some shame around it for me. Uh, there's where a lot of victim blaming happens in America, and I feel like the more you do that in any situation, when you're the victim, be real careful that you don't blame yourself. I didn't mean to walk through that glass door. A dude shouldn't have closed it. It was my workspace. I was there to work. I wasn't horsing around. And so I, I felt some shame about calling it a trauma. And so I remember my hand therapist was like, oh, your, your hands are fine. Nothing's wrong with them. He did some tests on them after I did a year. And he was like, yeah, you musicians are the worst. And I was like, <laughs> Yeah, is this is this what I'm paying you for, but you know, but but him, he, according to his tests, I was fine. But like, there was obviously something wrong, and something, and so he said, "Your hands are fine. It's all in your head." I was like, "Oh, well, what do I do with that? What do you do with it when it's all in your head?" But everything's in your head. We live between our ears. You know, maybe there was somebody at that point that saw me. Oh, my, Adam has a property management business. He's playing drums. He's got a studio. He sounds good, even though he hates playing drums. You know, it's like an image of me for some people was like, wow, he's kind of got it together. You know, he's mitigating some problems. But in my heart, I felt like I was a total poser. I felt like I was not the person I was claiming to be. And that difference, that gap between who I thought I was and who I was trying to be was really tearing me up. And so why was I so interested in maintaining that image of myself? And so what I realized, it is all in my head, and I realized I never grieved my trauma. I never thought for a minute that I had to, like, I mean, something traumatic happened, you kind of feel, well, you should kind of grieve that. But I never took that my, in my mind, I'm gonna overcome this, I'm gonna be strong, I'm gonna be macho, I'm gonna do everything it takes to overcome this. And so what something that happened, I saw a therapist right before I went on this ship, and she recommended a bunch of books to me. And this one was one of them. And uh, Terrence Real, he's a great family therapist, author. And he really opened my eyes up to what internal dialogue is and how it affects how you do anything. So as far as loving your practice, how you feel about it in here is the most important thing. You live between your ears. And your internal dialogue, bear with me, humor me for a minute when I suggest this, but your internal dialogue might be a conversation between who you are and who the image of who you are is. Just, just put it out there, put it in the background. I mean, if you're maybe like, that sounds kind of ludicrous to me. But uh, just live with it for a little while, because I've been living with it for a long while. And so that image I had of myself here, <laughs> Just want to bring this guy up again. My internal dialogue here, I am a rock star. I have done all the work necessary to get me where I want. I've studied with the best teachers. I play with the best musicians. I live in Los Angeles. I look good. I sound good. Da, 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 da. My internal dialogue was, you are the shit. I remember that guy. Really <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I felt entitled. I felt privileged. I felt like I deserved everything that I was going to be coming my way. And so my image of myself at that time talking to me in my head, you're awesome, you're great. Immediately after that, the image of myself of being a poser, being like someone who's not able to live up to who they're trying to convey was like, you're worthless, who are you kidding? You know, there's, it got really dark. And so that, I really felt this guy, Terrence Real, really struck a chord with me when I read about what he feels is who's talking in an internal dialogue. And I mean, there's, I've been, and I've heard it a thousand times that I shouldn't talk about this. I've been told a thousand times. And the person who told me is myself. The person who's told me I should not talk about this part of my life is me. Because I mean, my image of me that I'm trying to maintain, you know, this rock star guy that's, you know, count on me, I can be there for you, I'm likable, easygoing, you know, employable. 
And so a little contrary to somebody who has a disability to some degree. Now, I've done a lot of work to get over it, but it's still there. And so yeah, that's been my internal dialogue. And so this is a big deal for me to talk to. Thank you again, no one's left. <laughs> I appreciate it. And, and so this is my first effort to really put this out there and get it out, because I, I need to. And Stuart Jean's been amazing for sponsoring me here. And he knows that I have, oh, this, is, I, this is the beginning of it for me, because there is a lot going on as far as how I feel drum education should change and how I feel emotionally we should be prepared for what's out there for us. Because if y'all are gonna be artists, you're gonna encounter some hardship. It's not easy being an artist, A, and B, you're gonna run into artists who are struggling. And to have some compassion for whatever tra traumas, whatever troubles, whatever depression they might have, knowing that it exists in the world and that the person you're talking to who you want to hire you or you want to be in a band with might be struggling with that. Just know that it exists because I didn't want to share it with people. And the way I did share it with people was not good. There were ways that I could have talked about it, but it wasn't really the best. So here, so here's Adam as the lobster. He's, uh, journaling is a huge thing uh, as far as internal dialogue. If you really want to learn about your internal dialogue, I would highly recommend reading a book that's meaningful to you. And any time you come across something in the book that strikes a chord with you, just jot it down in a journal, it's a place that you're gonna write. And just like, oh wow, that kind of resonated a bit. That happened a lot with Terrence Real and Bell Hooks and Brene Brown and, and this one. It's very important to at least have that dialogue though. Yeah. <laughs> that's the first thing you gotta do is have that dialogue. A lot of people ignore that other image of themselves and they don't, they're not even aware that they have that and understand the conflict, that there yeah. is a conflict and if you, nobody can really address it other than yourself. Yes, That's really yeah, I mean, exactly. It's the most private conversation in the world. Like, I mean, at this day, you, any conversation in the world can be spied on, right? But your internal <laughs> dialogue, <laughs> I mean, well, hopefully you can't spy on it yet. <laughs> But I mean, it is deeply personal. It's a relationship you're gonna have from beginning to end, and it's private, and it affects everything in your life. How you feel about anything is gonna manifest in your internal dialogue about that. And this was a big book for me. This is about from the doctor, uh, The Body Keeps the Score. Uh, it's the doctor who diagnosed PTSD, and the symptoms of it, and what it is, and when I read that, I was like, holy shit, I am like textbook PTSD. Like my employment suffered from it, my personal relationships, my sense of self, everything that PTSD is, I had. And if I had known that when it happened, I feel like I could have done much, like really been far more successful with how I handled it. And so just know that there are people out there who are struggling and you yourself may someday be one of them. And so knowing that worst case scenario exists out there is a good thing. I think it's positive. And so uh, I was on the ship and uh, yeah, I under started to understand trauma and understand how other people, I started recognizing things that I felt in other people in my past. And I was like, holy shit, that guy had something fucked up. <laughs> and then as I got to know them and talk more about them, my, my predictions were confirmed. And so sometimes when people mistreat you, it's really because they're hurting. And as an artist and a musician, if you're going to be touring with people, especially, man, especially, well, any singers in the audience? <laughs> I don't know, it's been my experience that the singer has the most connection with the audience. They don't even have an instrument in front of them. And so just the ego that would make you want to be a singer and have nothing between you and the audience, it's, it's fragile. And guitar players, all you have is a little piece of wood between you and the audience. You know, it's still a pretty heavy ego there, faith. Drums, we have the least ego. What do we want? We want some bunch of hunks of metal in front of us to like kind of protect us, you know, keep us a little bit. Our sound is coming from something completely divorced from us. I feel like drummers are the least ego-driven of, you know, the, the kind of mentality that attracts us to this instrument 
is really one that tends to want to support more. We can't even make music without other people. I mean, we can hope to for that. We can. <laughs> That's what you hope for in a drum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I just like, why did you pick drums? I mean, why did you want all this stuff surrounding you? And like, I mean, how, how fragile of an ego most of those drummers have who have like 800 cymbals and 30 drums, you know, they're like, yeah, I don't even want to know there's an audience. You know, me, I like two cymbals four-piece kit. <laughs> I like to be able to have a connection, visual, physical, with people around me. But just know that other people in whatever musical context you're working in, just give, cut them some slack. Be, be kind to each other. Because you don't know what they're going through. And so, loving the space. All right, that was a good hour-long riff. I'm gonna play for a while. <laughs> hey, Adam, so, I'm gonna go. I need to go. Nice to see you. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Cheers, yeah. Adam. Cheers. So, so, Adam, Oleg is a the bass best. player who plays a giant bass on stage. So, where is that to Giant drummer. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. What else we got here? Oh, there's one little, that's one little thing I like. I wanted to show you. So, this is just. This, this, I think, this speaks of drumming to me. And so there's a new philosophy in architecture that's a physical principle of dynamic relaxation. And it's very recent, it's about 10 years old. And it's, it's able to create structures like this. And that, that looks like molar to me. That looks like how I want to play the drums. I don't want it to be so linear. And so that whole, I don't understand all the details of the physical principle around it, but I definitely resonate with the image of it. And so, if, as I've been trying to become more and more relaxed, I really like this kind of circular image. So you can't pull it off if you're tense. And so, especially with like Gruber technique and molar technique, should seek out the circles in your playing. Like it's not just up and down, moving around. There's a lot of circles happening. And so and what this does is it adds dynamics to your playing. So straight up and down. You heard it get louder? So yeah, so straight up and down. You want to be able to have the same intensity in your playing and have and be able to control the dynamics if you allow some more relaxation to your playing kind of able to involve some curves and some dynamic relaxation i feel like you can play more dynamically on the drums so i'll just do a little solo bass drum on that straight up and down for me caused tension and it caused kind of a trigger with this nerve damage that I have in my hand. So something that I worked on
is this idea of five rudiments. So we all know what rudiments are, even the non-drummers. <laughs> so the rudiments are these very complex systems of stickings, flams, ratamacues, all this stuff. And so I, you know, I love them. I use these patterns regularly. I practice them. But I really have an issue, issue with what they're called. So why is it called a rudiment? A rudiment, the word itself, means the basic building block of something. And is a ratamacue the basic building block of what we do as drummers? It's not. No, there's a conflict there. And so what happens when you are taught something that is in conflict with something else? It's something called cognitive distortion, where you're taught to believe contrary things. And I think that happens to a lot of drum students when they're working on their rudiments. You know, they're, okay, I want to be a good drummer. I want to be diligent. I want to be, you know, I want to play with my favorite musicians. I want to work on my rudiments to be one of the cats. And so they're there on their practice pad and an hour into it. I suspect a lot of students start thinking, why am I doing this? This is not what I, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> like, I signed up to make music and to like do this. And so I, like, I wonder, why did rudiments get to be that way? So I've researched it a little bit, and it goes back to field drumming. It goes back to like wartime drumming and the Civil War. And so these drummers, they would have the drum you know, over their shoulder, and they'd be playing this way. And so all these little phrases that you could play in the snare, they needed to learn so that they could march the troops into war. And so that's what we're learning now. I, do I, how many of us work on our rudiments? Yeah, you work, is, is, is am I pretty stringent about learning all, what, 40 rudiments, 36? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, we have a chart for it. Yeah, we have a chart. They introduce them. Yeah, but I, but I think they talk about it. Like, I mean, Jeff did talk about it. That yeah. you said there were like beatings, like for messages in the army, like initially. Yeah. You know, to like for different messages. Right, for, like, right, right. But, uh, but they're not like, you know, they're not supposed to be like that anymore. Right? Yeah, yeah. But they're still called rudiments. Yes. Yeah. And so, is it, and somewhere in your mind, you ever think, why are they called that? Sure. That's the wrong name for them. Rudimentary. I Rudiment there, but they, well, are they? I mean, man, a no, but that's I guess, I guess that's where it comes from, right? Yeah, yeah, rudimentary. But so I, so as I kind of trying to figure out my own perspective on how I wanted to dimension things and my re-educating myself, I felt like I needed to find out what a real rudiment is. And so I boiled like there are forty rudiments. I boiled them down to five. There are five rudiments that we use as drummers. One is your right hand. Two is your left. Hand. Three, your right leg. Four, your left leg. And five is your spine. Now, how are these the basic building blocks of drumming is, how are they not? Like, you cannot play drums without all five of these. And I would even say that the fifth one is the most important. It's the fifth element. It's the one that binds them all together. <laughs> and so the spine, it's like the spine of a book. You have a story in a book with all these pages. You rip out the spine pages go everywhere, you got no story. And so the spine is the story, it holds the story together of, that you're trying to tell with your other limb. And so that sounds like, a, <laughs> that's like, okay, that's kind of semantics, okay, it's clever, or whatever, you know, but I mean, to me, it's a huge psychological, philosophical shift in how people learn drums. So you got five rudiments on the board, conveniently labeled number five even, didn't even plan that. <laughs> Things work out sometimes. But so how do you work on your rudiments? Well, I keep thinking about this phrase, applying your rudiments to the drum set. We, we've heard this phrase, you, know, you learn all 40 rudiments, and then you apply them to the drum set. And to me, it's kind of like saying, OK, wax on, wax off, now go into the UFC. You know, like, that's like you're ill-prepared for what's necessary to pull off what you want to do on the drums. I mean, you work on a paradiddle on a practice pad, and then you go to this instrument, and like, what do I do? Like, you think, okay, I move here to go to floor tom, and I mean, and it's, it's terrible. So, I mean, how do, you, how do you apply your rudiments to the drum set if you're thinking of them in terms of your body becomes a whole different schematic. It becomes a whole new landscape of learning. So, the first thing I like to think of as far as how I want to apply my rudiments the drum set is first just working on my rudiments this way. 
just trying to get a straight stick path in the air, no tension. And so this would be technically French grip. I think that's a little Eurocentric. I also think German grip is a little Eurocentric. I also think Swiss triplets are a little <laughs> Eurocentric. I feel like we should have more of a global view of drums. So imagine a globe. Now I split it in half. So we have two hemispheres here. And try to follow the globe with your hand. Just try to have straight stick pads. Now this is an this is outward rotary. This is how I learned outward rotary. But this is that would be like the outside of your hunting zone. I, I think of I like to think of it as like your hunting grounds. You need to know the better you know your hunting ground, the more able you will be to catch your prey. So like the more you have this area, your environment that you're going to play mapped out, the better hunter you're going to be. Trap fat beast. <laughs> so with the right hand, I really like try to figure out in the air how you can get really full stick heights and be able to cover the whole hemisphere. So what's going to happen? This is inward rotary. I don't know. That's what I learned it as. And then you get the German grip, and then this crossover. This crossover point is what I call French grip to get to outward rotary. And this is a warm-up. This is an awesome warm-up. I like to take the tip of the stick and put it here. and get the full range of motion. Oh, man. Feels freaking great. And all the way in, and same thing with the left hand. And try to follow that hemisphere. Anyone want to try it? We got three drummers here. Oh, I'll give it a whirl. So OK, so you, you've probably been taught German. Yeah. German grip? Okay. Cool. Uh, let's just do one hand for now. Are you right handed? Yes. Okay. Give me German grip in the air. Okay. Cool. Give it as clean of a, as up, straight up and down of a stick path as you can. Okay. That's good. And then also try to have it end in the same place here and end here. And so if you put a metronome on and you do that in the air, that is an excellent exercise for learning time. Because what's going to happen? So you have some, you see some inconsistencies. You have a little bit of waver there, yeah. and then it's not, and it's coming like distant distances here, which is made overall. It's good, but uh, any inconsistency that happens here is going to be doubled when you hit strike a surface. Just, just think about that. <laughs> if you can't be like super consistent in the air, it's just going to be exacerbated when you actually get to the instrument. When you start dealing with rebound, rebound is a tricky physical. <laughs> right. yeah, the physics of rebound is intense, and it's something we deal with as drummers. Yeah, but yeah, it's already better. So yeah, now look in a mirror and watch yourself. Like put music on and just like just German grip. Try just German and try to come up and end in one place and end in the consistent way in the next place. I even like to do it in low light because then you see a little bit of more of the blur, and I like it with mallets because you get to see kind of the, the tip of the mallet gives you a really good indication of where you are. So do you, know, do you have French grip? Do you know French? Oh, OK, that's outward. OK, that's good. That's kind of like ride cymbal. Yeah. So good, good, good. And try to imagine there's a drum here and a drum here. And think of it. Great. That's it. Yeah, you're working on quarter notes. Quarter notes are super important because, like, just like the stroke in the air, any incons inconsistencies that are there, rebound is going to make that worse. If you can't have solid quarter notes, the minute you go to ace, triplets, anything else, it gets dicey. So, so yeah, so uh, I'll try to go uh, so find a uh, carve out your hunting ground. See how far this way you can go. Yeah, you had a night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the idea. Yeah. Oh, cool, cool. Now that is a floor tom stroke. You can go from hi hat to floor tom in a, no time if you have that stroke together. Yeah, that's a good one. That's great. Cool. Yeah, work on that. Try to get that more smooth. Try to get that more of a straight path, low light. Watch the follow the bouncing ball, as they say. And like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. And you got to kind of have a groover thing happening there. Cool. Nice. And now try to now try to do that and have, move it around the spectrum of the half of the hemisphere. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, man, that's great, man. You know what? I mean, man, the truth hurts, and it's good to know the truth in your playing. 
Like right. the, the fact is that when you get to the drum, and, and you put a drummer, you put anyone behind a drum set, they look cool. Like <laughs> you don't even have to be a drummer. So I mean, it's really when you're away from the drums, that's when you really find out the kind of drummer you are. And so yeah, I promise you, if you work on that and you get that more consistent, imagine a drum being up here and a drum being here and kind of that, just for the quarter notes, it's really gonna help your time. It's gonna help your pulse. You're gonna really be mapping out your environment. And so yeah, then being able to go and have that straight stick path all the way around, and a full stroke, and a full stroke like that. That's also great. I won't even make you do the left hand, because the, <laughs> the left hand is super tricky. Yeah. Anyone else wanna try it? Yeah, oh, let's just give it a whirl. So, and so, the, so try to put the tip of the stick in your pinky, like all the way back. Yeah, so that's the weight of the stick is gonna kinda, it's gonna train your hand a little bit. So like try try to do the full outward stroke. <laughs> okay, well, let's start with what you're comfortable with. For, uh, do you play German or French? I usually have to hold it like that. Oh, okay, yeah, do a stroke like that in the right hand, just in the air. You were like a, probably like 10 milliseconds ahead of the beat. It was because you came shallow on the path of the stick. So the more consistent, there, so the, your sound and your time and the space around the drums, they're all related. If you adjust the space, if you adjust the stick height, it's going to affect your sound and it's going to affect your time. If, you, if your stick height is consistent, your sound and your time will be more consistent. And so don't like, I mean, I've spent so many hours practicing drums without drums. I mean, so all drums are is a communicating device. Like that, like you, know, you were saying about rudiments, that's supposed to indicate, it's supposed to communicate something to somebody. So if this is communicating something, you need a message. <laughs> you know, otherwise, what are you doing there? So like really make sure that the message you have is reinforced with the physiology and the motions of your body. So that was good. I really, so now try to shift that. Try to shift that a little inside. Try to, like like uh, turning a doorknob a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea. <laughs> yeah, and now try to move it to German, where you work. I really know. Yeah, so this is a great stroke for a hi-hat. Because if you, you ever have that problem where you like hit your sticks when you cross like that, so if you want to be like big stadium <laughs> rocker, this is a great technique. You kind of put your arm out a little bit this way, and it gives you all kinds of wind up for that. Yeah. So yeah, cool. Let's give the third drummer in the room. Let's give him a try. Thank you. Nice. Done. Yeah. So what are you most comfortable with, German? Just uh, yeah, more American. Like oh, okay. American, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Heck yeah. with those Euros. <laughs> cool, go ahead. I like that. Cool. Yeah, yeah. That's consistent. That's really good. And it's now try to like spring up like you're actually rebounding. Yeah, you kinda like grabbed it and then it'll yeah, try to That's, man, this is a great exercise. Yeah. And there's there's something I like to call smack in the butt. So there's the butt end of the stick and hitting it in your palm. You hear that? That, I mean, this is drumming. This is, that is just an, this is just an amplification of what I'm about to do. So you can hear, I mean, it's all there. Are you using your fingers just to catch it, or are you actively like... So it's finger, it's... Right, just bring it down. Yeah, catching it here, so you can do that. It's harder to do on this stroke, because you're not actually hitting anything, but German grip can totally hear that. So here are your pair diddles. And I promise, you do that for 10 minutes, and you're gonna feel some burn. And so, the funny thing is, like, catching it, 
it's, to me, it's a lot like hitting a drum. It feels it's very, it's the same thing as the. So it, emula it emulates the impact shock of the end of the stick. Yeah. It's doing it backward at the bottom yep. of the stick. And you're forced to rebound it yourself. Your muscle is doing the rebound rather than rather than so many drummers. Man, how many like how many snare drums here are like crank insanely high so that the stick just yeah. bounces right back at you? And that's like how and man, drummers who work don't tune their snares that way. Maybe gospel music like it's tuned that way, but I mean most styles of music. You want tone out of the snare, and you need to work for tone. Like an 16-inch floor tom tuned low, it takes muscle. And so, I mean, if you really think that, wow, I might be on a gig where I need to play a low tuned 16-inch floor tom, I might go to the hotel cafe and have to sit in and impress somebody, and if I don't have the muscle to pull that sound out of the 16-inch floor tom, I'm going to drag. If you can't pull the sound out, if you're going to, your tempo is going to be affected. You're gonna have your snare cranked, you're all fine here, you know, boing, it's gonna bounce right back at you. But yeah, really building that strength here is great. And having that, so this is, this is for me, this is working on rudiments. And this has nothing to do with what drummers typically call rudiments. So, so yeah, this is the, kind of the five rudiments idea. The fifth rudiment, I'll stay here. So we're just talking about hands. You can also, toes, it's a little bit more of a finesse stroke with the feet. kind of doing an uh, alternating sticking between your right hand and your left foot. And, I, and so what this is doing, the left foot is kind of keeping the rest of you honest. Because I mean, you, you know, sometimes drummers, they play some like kind of uh, linear pattern or some sticking and it's not quite grooving, you know, and there's some inconsistency. You can't really tell where it is and even when you're doing it, you can't. Well, if you do this, that kind of maps out all the subdivisions for you. And so, like I said, the truth hurts. Well, you need to experience some hurt if you really want to like progress as a musician. You really have to be honest with yourself. Where am I? And so doing this. Whoa, hear a little flam on the foot there. Whoops. <laughs> So working on this, and you can do this anywhere. You can, anywhere you want. And so, so I've heard students say to me, oh, well, it feels different on the floor than my bass drum pedal. Well, is that the bass, why is that? Shouldn't your bass drum pedal project? I mean, if we are gonna sign off on this idea that the drums communicate, then shouldn't we be able to, shouldn't the drums just be projecting what we do as drummers? So that's my thought about it. So, I mean, and I've noticed, like, warming up for gigs, you can't always, like, sit at a drum set 30 minutes before you're gonna about to go on. And so if you can warm, this is an unbelievable warm up. And you're in some dank green room, and you gotta go out and, like, play your ass off. First song is, like, 300 beats per minute. And, like, if you hit that without warming up, you're gonna choke, and you're gonna be stressed the whole gig, because if you start off that way, it's hard to recover from starting a gig cold. So this is a great way to warm up so that when you get to the drums, you can make sure that your subdivisions are even.
because you, I feel like you always want to be one step above your performance level. Like I feel like the amateurish view of playing drums is like, okay, I'm going to keep working on this and I'm going to record myself on my camera 800 times until I get that 30 seconds that's good enough for Instagram. And so that's what a lot of drummers do. And so they're, they kind of create in their mind this idea of like, oh, like the best I need to be is 30 seconds on Instagram. When so it's really the absolute opposite of that. It's like you that's on to, every instrument, really. <laughs> that's actually on everything. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a shift. It's not the way I grew up playing drums. So how that 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 image you want to project of yourself versus who you really are. Man, that's so it. And so I'm like, yeah, exactly. And so when then the more that gap is between what your image you're trying to convey, your impression management, I've heard it called. Uh, versus like what you really know you do, like the more of a gap that's there, it's really dangerous for us. So, so this I'm getting into five rudiments, and uh, it's two four thirty five. So the practicing dynamics. Okay, I just want to talk a little bit. Okay, talk about the glow. We talked about projecting how your message is here, and the more you can do it away from the drums, then when you get to the drums, let that be a vehicle. Let them. Let what you do on the floor dictate how you manage your bass drum pedal. Like, just don't pull the bass drum pedal out of the box and be like, hey, that's how I'm going to play. Make sure that it is representing how it feels to play without it. So experiment with different tensions. And like for me, I mean, I'm 6'8", and i got a size 14 foot. So I mean, just the physics of that means that I'm going to probably have to adjust my pedal different than most people. And whatever your unique physiology is, is going to affect how you do it too. And so and I'm, I'm a big fan of pulling the beater off of the head. I feel this is, the, the, I'm curious, so the three drummers who are here, do you pull the, do you bury the beater or do you pull it off the head? I, I used yeah. to bury it. But yeah, I had to. Yeah. I had to change it. It's just yeah. when you when you try to do like consistent like three or four kick drums, you can't you can't do it. You're always late. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. There's so many drummers who do that. I'm like, how many drummers? Do you like, I mean, you just see, why would you do that in the hand? So yeah, definitely pulling the beater off the head. It just makes it louder. Like bass drum is beat one. It needs to be loud in rock music. You need to have a full throw on the bass drum. You need to make sure that snare is equal in dynamics to the kick drum. And so there's a molar bass drum. I'll, I'll get to run out of time with that. But being able to turn on this little kick drum, being able to have a big sound out of it. I mean, even and then vocalists, it's out of their register. They get bugged when you like the cymbals and snare are too loud because that's where they're singing. But you can hit kick drum pretty loud without bothering anybody, and that lets everyone know where B1 is. Yeah, it's all, all about that bass, man. <laughs> you keep that groove all about down. the bass. It is. And then the balance between the toms and snare, I highly recommend turning, taking the snare off and practice. I'm going to play a little exercise, the dynamic exercise. It's a unison dynamic exercise. try to come up with melodies that way. It's, I love this form That's of practicing. Cool. And it's something that I had to do because I had such this tension issue with my hand that it always wanted to jump ahead. And so the way that I would mitigate that is like doing a lot of unison exercises. And in my head at the time, I'm like, oh my god, I should be working on left foot clave. I should be working on sevens and nines and you know, being a better drummer. But unison is a huge deal. Like even five milliseconds. If your kick drum and your snare drum are off five milliseconds, it's a it's a big deal. Like difference between now you hear the 
second version, and you might, in the context of a band, you might not recognize what's happening. It's just something sounds like, eh, not quite right, you know? But it's the, the, the bass player is just gonna be like, wow, that other drummer I played with last night sounded better playing this group. Yeah. And in the like, studio, it's, you're done. <laughs> yeah, and you'll hear it in the studio. And man, recording yourself and actually seeing the transience of what you're playing on the timeline and seeing like, wow, these little tiny <laughs> that flam to happen, that's great. And that's another problem with rudiments. We learn flams way too early. And where do we put the flam? Early. The flam goes before the note. We're teaching ourselves to rush. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. I freaking hate rudiments. We're also teaching ourselves not to know what we're playing because we're learning these patterns all on one surface. And it's like, what? Okay, well, here's a quiz. What's the left hand rhythm in a double paradiddle? One, two, three, four, five, six. Do you know? No, you don't. Most people don't because they don't have to be like, wait, dot, 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 It's like dot, 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 dot. You should know what that rhythm is. You're playing it, right? But what the rudiment does, it teaches you as long as you know the sticking, you're cool, you're great, you're a great drummer. But I mean, and that's the coolest thing to know is what's happening in your hands. Because I mean, extremely aware of the rhythm in each hand. And so how I would practice rudiments, I had to because of this issue in my hand, but later I realized, wow, I'm glad I did that, is practicing unison, no matter what you're doing in either hand in a rudiment, practice it unison. So an example would be a paradiddle. Because inside of that, you can be that left hand or right hand lead then. So you're teaching your hands to play these rhythms in, in unison. You can either go... And so if you know what you're playing, you can play the same thing over and over, and you can sound like you're really mixing it up as long as you know what these rhythms are. Like uh, one of my favorites, I call it an asymmetrical paradiddle. So I mean, 
it's, it's just, there's so much more you can do with stickings when you don't think of them as rudiments. And I do want to move ahead. Although, I mean, I feel like I could spend hours on that because I have. But, <laughs> but uh, oh, a tension gauge, a little quick one on that. I did mention that time that I would shift them at the House of Blues. I go to the ride and my entire arm clubs up and I'm like thinking like I'm playing the eye up with my foot, smiling. So what I would do, I would find, I would get so pissed. I would just be so mad that this is happening. Just feel such a disconnect between what I'm trying to convey and what I'm experiencing. But I would just get furious and I would tense. And as hard as I could, I was like scared I was gonna break the stick. And then I realized, wow, when I do that, wow, I've just exhausted my arm and I'm relaxing. And I was like, wait, this is kind of working for me. Like I'm experiencing these problems where I'm totally tensed up and there's asymmetry. I'm relaxed here, I'm tight here. If I totally overdo the tension, my hand wants to relax. And so I started developing this exercise where I would get as tight as I possibly can, and I imagine that being 10. Just kind of hold it for a while, not to, not to break the stick, but, <laughs> but being very tense. Now fall back and count down. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. So zero is that point where the stick falls out of your hand. And now where I love to live is at one. If you can live on the drums at one, you all the tension is a conductor for sound. So if you're completely relaxed, the sound comes here and isn't absorbed into your hand, it is, doesn't end up getting absorbed into your muscles. I mean, relaxation gives you a better sound, gives you a better feel. You can never be the exact amount of tense at any given moment. Like you can be perfectly relaxed and always be there. But it's like, okay, I'm gonna be more tense now. It's like, wait, am I more tense now than I was five minutes ago? I mean, the point is like to be consistent on the drums, it's better to be completely relaxed. And so anything you're doing, if it's not working for you and you're, you're feeling some kind of tension with it, let's say left hand lead paired to uh, Something's not working about it, right? Okay, I'm just gonna kind of like 10, nine, eight, seven, And relax and so I, a lot of times I'll just like try to keep the beat going and kind of, that's, it's a really great relaxation exercise I'm sure we're all taught to be relaxed when we play relaxed mentally relaxed physically well this is a very good physical way to relax the funny thing about Gruber is it's actually at zero like if I, if they're like, this is kind of technique, if I'm going to stop here, it, the stick falls. But it's because it's coming back, and I'm moving back to here. Philosophies is a DVD that he put out that deals with this. It's the one that I had on when I was the lobster on the cruise ship. It's the one that I was going through. I also studied privately with him. He has a Drumeo thing about it, and man, it's so amazing. Give it some time, and you'll find yourself being able to play so much more relaxed than you did before. So, so something that I found out about my time on the ship is this whole idea of internal dialogue from this book, translated very much into this book. So growth mindset is a modern <laughs> academic strategy for improving student success. And so I'm just gonna read a little passage of it from you, for you. 
It's, uh, this is dictate, this is kind of trying to describe to the reader what is a growth mindset response and what is a fixed mindset response. So imagine that your parents became upset when you didn't do what they asked you to do. Why would they be this way? So the fixed mindset child would say, they were worried I might be a bad kid. Kid might actually feel that way. A growth mindset view of that is they wanted to help me learn ways of doing it better next time. And I remember looking at it, so there's a whole list of these. And I remember looking at that like, uh, wow, that is this. This is how I was dimensioning my internal dialogue. I was qualifying myself, I was labeling myself with positive labels when I was the rock star. And now that I, after I had this incident, I was giving myself negative labels and I started coming to terms with that and understanding it. And when I learned about growth mindset, I felt like, oh, well, that's an offshoot of something I already know. And I, I love that. And it's being implemented in colleges. We actually have a huge rock star here right now in the world of online education, Professor Fabiola Torres. <laughs> She's been consulting me on my, uh, my approach to drum education. And so I've been learning. I mean, I had such a resonance with what growth mindset is that I really wanted to know much more about other forms of progressive academic education. And I've found more and more parallels with what I learned on the ship. I don't even know if they're intentional, or I don't know if this is sort of a, just a different version of dealing with the pitfalls of internal dialogue, the positives and negatives of it, but it definitely resonates with me. And so that's where CHOPS 2.0 comes from, for me. So there's how I used to, man, when I did 3D drumming, my instructional video years ago, I, it was about chops. I wanted to impress people. I wanted them to look like, wow, Adam Gus is a great drummer. He looks good, sounds good, he's cool. He's got all this stuff he can play in all styles. I really kind of, at the end of the day, didn't care if my students learned anything. I, you know, I see that now, and I hate to it. <laughs> but that's where it was coming from. But now I'm hypersensitive to the people that want to study with me or the people that I'm trying to train to learn something. And so back, uh, growth mindset is just one particular part of that. What is non-Googleable is also a very important part of this. I feel like everything I've talked about is non-Googleable. I haven't seen anyone talk about things the way I have. Has anyone else? Not until I share it. <laughs> that's exactly, that's the exact response. So what happens? So I'm sharing this. So what really ends up being the, is the understanding. So there's the knowledge, there's the data, and it's understanding it. And so this leads to, oh, that's a nice segue. Thank you, Ariel. So the flipped classroom is the idea that the lecture the, is online and the class is actually practicing. Like a version of the flipped classroom was when we did the stick, stick uh, strokes in the air together. Like that, you, you can't Google that. You can't have somebody come up to you and show you like, oh, try this out, no, 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 no. It's, so that, I mean, and so something that is non-Googleable has value. So seek out those things that are non-Googleable. If we're talking about return on investment in your academic career, anything that you're able to do, provide somebody that is non-Googleable and is useful has value. So just be aware of that, it's something that I am definitely aware of and has really made me want to talk more about this because there are so many, there's so much out there. I mean, why would there need to be anything more on drum education in the internet? Well, it's because there are things that people can't quite find online and I want to provide that. And so this uh, non-Google comes from a, a innovator, David Thornburg. And something else he talks about is campfires, caves, and watering holes. And this applies very much to students of MI. So the campfire, it's how, I mean, from the beginning of time, people have taught each other. So, so, and so going back to caveman days, the campfire, there's the educator, the learned, the leader. He's at the campfire. He's telling people what he thinks they should learn. They're like, oh, mm, oh, mm, OK. <laughs> so like, what do we do with this information? Well, we go to the cave, and we practice. Okay, I want to gain these skills, and so okay, I've been in the cave. I'm kind of beating my head against the wall. I made a little progress. I got to go and talk to some other people, my peers, some other people who are also learning. I need to go to the watering hole and kind of, you know, run some ideas. Like I'm trying this out. Oh, we'll try this out. Oh, so you learn a lot from your peers, 
And so no matter what era in civilization we're in, 2019 or BC, whatever, here we are now, there are these three concepts of education. And so just be very aware. So right now, I'm kind of assuming the role of the campfire. I'm assuming that I have something that people want to hear. And so feel free to take this that I say, or any of your teachers say, and take it to the cave. But when you're in the cave, don't do what I did. Don't become totally obsessed with what happens in the cave. Because like, I feel like I put too much emphasis on that. There needs to be a balance between what happens in the cave, between what you're learning from somebody who knows more than you about one issue, two issues, and then also what happens in a watery hole. So the, if, as things move more and more online, which allows for more return on investment for students, cost is slow, and that's the less you pay, then the more that's better for us, right? <laughs> So I mean, the more that we can kind of keep maintain this, like, oh, I want to make sure that I get the campfire, I want to be able to practice in the privacy of the cave, and I also want to be able to have my peer group. I don't know, you have awesome instructors here, you have places to practice, you have each other, and man, it's, this is really an amazing environment for you. So you should, but I mean, it doesn't, it, it might not be if you don't take advantage of it. So it's really up to you as students, as well as us as educators, to provide a return on investment that's possible based on campfires and caves and watering holes. So flipped classroom, equity, humanization, uh, it's really the democratization of education. It's really trying to bring education to everyone. Because the, the data's in, and education in the past has benefited certain racial groups more, certain economic groups more, and certain genders more. And they were trying to break this down to have it more equal. And so finding, like, for that to, for things to be more equi equitable, uh, that has to change the way we teach them. And growth mindset is a big way to do that, as well as backward design, flipped classroom, humanization. And we're getting close to being done. So I just wanted to wrap up. Like, all this is based around loving your practice. And so, but at the beginning of the lecture, I, I kind of in, sort of implied that practice was just what you're doing at the drum, but the practice is really those three things. It's you being a practitioner of your art, of your craft, and that involves learning from others at the campfire, practicing private in your cave, getting your stuff together, and also being at the watering hole, and then taking it into your life. And so being a practitioner and loving all those three facets, I think, is really how to really elevate your playing and make other people want to play with you. And so like, just kind of in the privacy of your cave, write down the reason you play drums. Like, whatever that reason is, don't even tell me. Just make, and really think about what is that reason. And for me, the main reason that I want to play drums is so that I can play with Ariel Mann. I'm serious. I was like, what better motivation than that? I want to get my shit together here so that I get to love playing with people that I admire. That is a solid reason to work on this. And for me, that is just a wellspring of motivation. It's the motivation gas station, I like to call it. It's like constantly fueling that motivation that you have, knowing that, wow, if I like really keep my get my time solid and be able to react to what I hear, people like Ariel Mann will want to play with Ariel Mann, do you want to play with me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll close this out with a little jam. I could say that I love playing with Adam because Adam, um, I play with a lot of really great drummers and some have incredible chops, incredible groove, incredible pocket. But Adam is he's more than a, just a drummer, he's a musician and he simply um, understands music. On, on a sonic and like emotional level. So I know no matter what I play, he'll react almost um, telepathically. <laughs> um, yeah, we have played together quite a bit, but I know that no matter what supposed style or genre we're playing, I'll feel comfortable playing with him. And that's, that for me is the most important thing about it, not just to drum any player or any great relationship. Yeah. <laughs> Listen and understand.
Thank you.
Thanks for showing up. Cool. Well, my time is up here. Uh, but I guess, Matt, any questions you have? I would love some questions. Anyone? Is that your drum set? <laughs> no. no, it's not. I like it, though. It's got the shiny sparkle on it. <laughs> um, what's your next step in integrating all of these things into your next class? Into my next class? Uh, what is my next step? It's refining it. I feel like I've arrived here, and I have a genuine feeling that I'm onto something that is not out there. It is non-Googleable. That's why I'm serious. I was asking, like, is anything I'm saying kind of resonating with you and other people? Because I really have looked. I mean, this journey that I've been on, I was like, man, who else out there can shed some light on what I'm dealing with? And I really haven't been able to find anything that's available online. Tony Bronigal, thank God for that guy. Bruce Becker. Being in front of him and him like breaking down like what I needed to do to get over this issue I have, like that was not Google. That was incredibly valuable to me. To the point that I upended my life in order to work on it. I mean I packed up my studio, quit my everything I was doing and left on a cruise ship just knowing that I needed to hibernate and kind of work on this. So I mean I'm still I'm two years out from that. I've learned a lot from it and I'm still moving ahead with it. Uh, I'm shooting a lot. I'm, I'm aiming to be a premium content provider. I've, at my recording studio, I have a video production rig set up, and I'm doing video editing. Go to my Facebook page and my Instagram if you want to see the videos that I'm working on. But I really feel like creating this video content is going to help me to convey the message best. And then, the, 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 yeah? Uh, did you feel uh, like your time management and discipline skills were really strong all the way through North Texas and all the way through what you were doing? Or did you feel like there was a huge ramp up after the incident in order for you to get to this place? Huh. That's a good question. That's a great question. Uh, I've always been a practicer. Mm -hmm. I've always, like, minimum 20 hours a week. That's what I try to look at, like three hours a day on my instrument. That's my minimum. I think it's more uh, learning how to be um, effective with your time and practicing. That's what I think we always continue to learn is how to achieve the most with the least amount of time is knowing, learning how to practice efficiently other than just like getting to a room with your instrument and just like start playing and always you're gonna mostly practice what you're comfortable with. Yeah. And I think you having that um, disability Forced you to obviously practice on what you're not comfortable with. Yeah. And I think that's just an important thing to um, internalize, I think, from the beginning, is to practice what's more difficult than what already sounds good. Because if you're practicing and it sounds good, that means you're not doing it right. You know? Yeah, I, I like this idea of budgeting your practice. Not in a right, that's money it. sense or and not even a time sense, but. I like sort of like if you have a kid, and you, know, you know, you can buy anything in the store with five dollars. That's uh, like you know, okay, oh well, that's very low. well. So I can play anything I want on the instrument as long as I'm working on that that uh, alternating stick in between the right and the left foot. That's like a form of budgeting practice. <laughs> give myself the freedom to enjoy playing things and doing things that sound good, but in a context that I'm working on something. So, and then you'll stumble across like, oh, wait a minute, when I go left hand on this symbol, it's flamming with the hi-hat, like, okay, I need to break that down, I need to slow it down. I think that this idea of always doing something that you're uncomfortable with, fused with something that you are comfortable with. Right. Like, yeah. like left hand lead is another one that I've been spending a ton of time with. And so I have these turnarounds that I do. So like So you can play the stuff you always play, but there are these figures a double or or triplet. Mixes it up, and so so the pattern sounds the same, but you're de we're definitely working on things you couldn't do before, and it completely changes your phrasing around the drums. Uh, there's all alternating sticking. I just played. I just added a couple. 
couple turnarounds in there. That's a great way to practice that. The same thing with triplets. <laughs> on it to shift it around to left hand lead and being able to have it feel the same that's the big thing like that's the like the, the pulse keeping the pulse with the body if it feel if you're like yeah, it, something there like why did that happen why can I suddenly not dance to my own groove and this is a rule of, of thumb if you can't dance to your own groove no one else is gonna want it so I mean so make sure that when you're playing you're able to keep this pulse. Because I feel like, I mean, it can make, it keep it current. I mean, I feel like the spine is the whistleblower. I feel like your hands and your arms, they're like, hey, we got all this cool stuff we could do. Hey, maybe, you know, we can get, you know, Ukraine to look into Biden. You know, oh, well, wait a minute. No, I don't think that's cool. I think the spine is to kind of keep the hands you know, together. And so I think, like, I've seen drummers, you know, they're like, oh, cool. Yeah, man. And then they go for a fill and they stop. And it's like, why did you stop? It's because there's something uncomfortable with that that kind of keeps you from being able to dance to it. And so I think that's going to keep time for I think it's a big reason people rush. I mean, if you're constantly like, you know, if you're always moving like this to everything you do, your body remembers the tempo. But the minute that stops, you're kind of dependent on the drum set rebound. You're dependent on what your hands are doing. And so this was a, something I worked on, especially with my inclination to rush in the right hand. So I really worked on really being able to keep this pulse no matter what. Uh, but did that answer your question as far as work ethic? That was lovely. <laughs> there is also something I didn't want to talk about. Uh, if, and if you need to go, you're, you're free to leave at any time, obviously. But uh, I did want to talk about the Fest Self Journal. So this is something that I've been using to for time management. It's uh, so. It's really cool. It's uh, so it, it results first. It starts. It's it's based around three months, and I do six months because I'm only half good at using it. <laughs> if I used it every day, it would be three months. But I tend to use it like three days a week. And so, so first you map out your goal. So my result goal, I mapped out for this. I wanted to design my drum school. This is six months ago, and here I am at MI starting it. So I guess working to some degree already. So it's uh, it's results of it. I want this to be my life's work. I want it to be my legacy, professional goals, film, you know, film public domain, teaser videos, blah, blah, blah. I fill all this out. Another result goal, brand Adam Gust. I want to kind of design, be a global influencer, premium content provider. These are goals I have to, that I'll be pursuing the rest of my life. And then take control of my time was another, that was my third result goal. And then you check yourself on it. You sign off when it started. And it was April 15th, and uh, October 15th is when I was supposed to complete it. I'm a little a couple weeks late, but it's all right. <laughs> so, and then you go and you fill out your weeks, but the most important one for me is the daily. So it's funny, because this is what I've been using for this lecture also, but it, I mean, it's, it plans your day, and it can also plan your lecture. So, well, you know what? I will get some pages to you all. Curious, you can print them out. So if you look So the first cool thing you will notice about it is that the date you get one. You don't have to be a student. <laughs> but I am. <laughs> Professor Torres, would you like one? She did ask me to call her by her first name, Professor. <laughs> so what I do, I first okay, you'll see where the notes are. And so uh, the night before I'll fill out what my notes are, like what do I want to accomplish today, and then towards the bottom I start getting towards like what do I just want to accomplish in general. 
So then when you start your day, you look at the timeline, like the, those numbers that are by, first you fill in the date, and then those numbers are time, like it could be 6 a.m. or 9 p.m. Uh, you try to filter what you put in your notes into your time in the day. And I call it living on the grid. So you're, you're mapping out your hour by hour, you're breaking down into half hour blocks. And when I started doing this, I started realizing, oh my god, I spend way too much time on my phone. I would realize, like, wait a minute, but I've had this mapped out, and 20 minutes went by, and like, oh, I was just on Facebook for a little while. And so I, it just, if you start to shotgun your social media, your emails, you start to put in that kind of thing into the grid, and then you have these chunks of time to practice where you can focus. Because I noticed, like, if I would play drums, and like, I get a call, or I get an email, or somebody would respond to something, I get kind of distracted, and then I come back to the drums. And I, I do much better in two hour blocks. If I have like a solid two hour piece of time that I know I'm at the drums, I, I feel like I get to the end of it and then I've accomplished something. And so I feel like this, the, this best self journal is great for that. And then you get back and you get to the end of the day. And it has the morning gratitude, which is great. And then your goal for the day and today's targets, did you achieve them, lessons learned, what are my wins? And then what am I grateful for? And gratitude is an amazing thing. There's a study done, like the happiest people in the world, like what is the most consistent thing with people who have evidence of a lot of happiness in their life is they have a lot of gratitude. Like being aware of how good you have it in whatever way. And that's something that's terrible about privilege. Like I, playing the drums is such a privilege. We have these beautiful instruments. Here you are in the school with amazing faculty. You're surrounded by like-minded students, it's a privilege, it's not a right. It can be taken away from you. Drumming can be taken away from you. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that that is a privilege allows you gratitude for it, which increases your happiness, I think. So I mean, and so I'm never gonna try to be the best drummer in the world, but I think I'm doing really good at being the most grateful drummer in the world <laughs> because my privilege got revoked my, but uh, I've been working on it and I'm back at a point that I love to play and I love it so much and I'm really appreciative for MI for sponsoring me here and for your students hanging out with me, for Aria Man for playing with me, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, any other questions? I was just going to point out in the spirit of gratitude to somebody who, I've watched you, the freedom to practice anywhere and Adam would practice everywhere. He'd be beaten on the back of the seat that you're sitting on in the car. He would play on stair rails. It was just constant. But as a guitar player, you're like, Shh, I don't have a guitar. I, you can't play air guitar and learn anything. That's incorrect. But no, no, no. <laughs> you can warm up, but you're, you're not making the kind of like no, focused progress. No, Adam, he showed the, 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 the exercise um, of the pressure. Yeah. And, like, and it's funny because I... I I had a teacher that showed me a very similar exercise with guitar pick, or like with the left hand, how much pressure you don't need to exert in order to get a good tone. Right. Yeah. And it gave me exercises to do, um, like without a guitar, that actually helped me so much. Yeah, I mean they're they're useful, but to be able to practice the fundamentals of rhythm, like that. yeah, you guys have the range of a kit sitting in the DMV line or whatever. <laughs> Just pull the sticks out of a bag and you go. And who cares if people are looking at you weird? He certainly didn't. Believe me, it was like so irritating. But man, it it was a gift to play with him. It was really great to see, and and hit the focus on getting that playing, like focusing on the twenty percent of the things that you aren't doing well is eighty percent of your improvement. The Pareto principle from the from Tim Ferriss that you were talking about yeah. earlier. I mean, those basic things. You guys have such a great gift to be able to do that. Like, while you're listening to him, you could have your sticks out and do this. It's, you're not gonna get a room full of singers being able to not sing and still practice. It's, yeah, it's being, pretty being, awesome. And thank you. He, yeah. yeah, it was annoying, yeah. believe me. But <laughs> it, the, results, <laughs> the results are great. Yeah, being able to warm up before a gig is a huge deal. Man, you hit the stage and you're cold, and you will—you're not going to perform well. Your confidence is blown, I think. And so I, I always try to have some form of warming up. And in the spirit of non-Googleable learning, I'm going to teach you a trick that is going to keep you hired. So you warm up with the sticks here, and you go up to your singer. Oh, here we go, Facebook. <laughs> uh, warm up. Yeah. Warm up your shoulder. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> so now just imagine being a singer and you're yeah, I gotta get pumped up to go out there and I gotta sing and all of a sudden your drummer does that and you're just like, oh wow. So I've I've kept a few gigs. <laughs> By doing little tricks of the trade. And it's a and it's a great exercise because it doesn't rebound and so you're you know you're actually really warming up your hands if you get in the air or on or it can be another good way of this way. Yeah, against your Ooh, any other questions? All right, well, man, thank you guys so much. It's, wow, it would have been so different if you weren't here. <laughs> so, this is my first endeavor with MI. Stuart has been really kind to me, and he, I believe me, I have brought what I'm doing to other institutions, and they didn't want it, any of it. I, and it was really scary for me for a while to think like, wow, is what I'm talking about that terrible? <laughs> I mean, is it like not useful? But a very traditional mindset of education doesn't want students to hear this. And so, I mean, Matt, you are going to encounter hardship. You're going to encounter people who have encountered hardship. And just having an understanding, more of a compassion and an empathy for what people who are going through, who have had, who are having problems, and maybe not, they're not wearing it on their sleeve. There's covert and overt depression that uh, Terrence Real talks about, and most people's is covert. It, it's, it's felt on the inside. And it's that gap between who they think they are and who they exhibit on the outside. I had, man, I had friends talk about how stupid it was what Anthony Bourdain did. And that person to me just has no empathy for what he was experiencing. I mean, how loved was that guy? And who knows what his internal dialogue was up until his death. And just so, I mean, it's, it sounds negative on one hand, but on the other hand, if you encounter it or if somebody you love encounters some hardship in their life, knowing, having tools to overcome it and understanding that you want to make the image of yourself consistent with who you are to some degree, the best you can. And so whenever, and whenever you, there becomes an asymmetry in your dialogue, whenever either like at the point in my life where I was like, yeah, you're the best, you got your whole life ahead of you, you're gonna be the most amazing person in the world versus post-accident, you're worthless, you're flawed, you'll never get, I mean, symmetrical internal dialogue would be what a friend would say to you. And asymmetrical internal dialogue would either be what like a fanboy would tell you or what your worst enemy would tell you. And just make sure that you keep your worst enemies at arm's length. <laughs> and, and to the students, some of the, the stuff that's so important that you're talking about really are issues of emotional intelligence and psychology. And those are not things that you guys are concentrating on as, as younger students. Yeah. Uh, so much of what he's talking about is important internally to be able to fix the, the inevitable hardships that you'll run into. But it's also important for assessing your bandmates and your yeah. business partnerships and the other people and to find people that really emotional resonate with you to find if there are problems about how you support uh, how you're going to support them through that but most importantly when you find people in your band or in your sphere that are a, a detriment to your future and you stick with them probably longer than you should mm -hmm. because of reaching this goal or doing this yeah. thing and then you find yourself a couple years yet later what am I doing why did I do this and so this stuff that is really that marriage you're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> this stuff that that, that, that doesn't get taught, it's non Googleable, yeah. is so so important. So true. thank you for uh, you know beginning to scratch the surface of these thoughts because these things are typically uh, not taught. And we certainly didn't learn these yeah, in younger musicians. I, so I'll never forget my drum teacher telling me, "You need to eat, sleep, breathe drums. You know, if you're going to be successful, it needs to be your entire life." Yeah. And that worked for me up until a point. Up until that point, I had my accident where I realized my entire community were musicians, which is great on the one hand, but musicians are the last people who are going to help you through a traumatic injury. I mean, I, that sounds so terrible, but they, no, I'm freaking serious because they see themselves. So like, I had a bass player friend that will remain nameless. He was like, wow, a drummer I used to love playing with, one of the best in town, whatever. He felt that way. Now we can barely play. I'm supporting my three kids playing bass, my wife doesn't work, what if that happened to me? And so it's a kind of a kill the messenger feeling that a lot of musicians have. 
And so, it, man, I just I couldn't have predicted that. And like looking back at it now, I think I would have known how to navigate those conversations better. And I hope this has helped you focus on the love of your practice, loving the practice of being a musician and connecting with the people you're working with and understanding that man, we're all human and it ain't easy. <laughs> so, any other questions? Rob? Well, thanks. Thanks all. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks Facebook Live, anyone who's still there. Hello. <laughs> Cheers.